safe here. Open your eyes now. Wow. <laughs> Magnificent, isn't it? I've never seen anything like it. You never will again. Truly awe-inspiring. Indeed. <laughs> you know, Kelly, Niagara Falls is one of the great wonders of the world. You uh, just have to experience it in person to truly appreciate it. I, I could have appreciated it from the bottom of the gorge, Rex, <laughs> instead of atop this bridge. From the bottom. Oh, what the fun is that, eh? <laughs> Look at all the tourists down there, craning their necks to get a view of this place. I tell you, it's heaven on earth. It, it does seem to attract people in droves. <laughs> Maybe one day you'll meet a pretty girl and bring her here for your honeymoon. It's truly a romantic sport. I I'm sure I'll be too busy running our business than to have time for pretty girls. <laughs> Nonsense. There's always time for pretty girls. I, I suppose if, if I had a lady as lovely as your Flo, I might reconsider. Yes, my Flo. Truly one of a kind. You're a lucky man, Rex. A lovely wife, booming business, community that respects and admires you. <laughs> well, it's all yours for the taking, Pelly. You just need to reach out and grab her with both fists. But both fists? Yes, both fists, like a prize fighter, hungry for the kill. Can we go back now? Uh, I want to, I want to show you another spot with a remarkable uh, uh, another time, Virgil. Uh, no time like the present. Uh, no, I've had enough for today. Oh, come I'm on, going Kelly. back to the hotel. But you'll have to get over this silly fear of heights. No, not now, Rex. The wind is picking up again. Oh, stop being such a coward. I said no. Listen, Pelly. You really need to drink in the falls from a bird's eye point of view. <laughs> Just like so. Believe me, you'll thank me later. Virgil, I said another time. Uh, just a little further, just a little... Leave me alone! Well, don't take no for an answer, Kelly. You should know that by now! Good morning, Lord Somerset. Ah, oh, good morning, old boy! Rex? You think of my dress, Rex? Why? It's exquisite, Flo. <laughs> You'll be the most beautiful woman at the party. <laughs> oh, it's made of 100% French silk, the finest textile in Europe. Oh, befitting your silky smooth complexion. <laughs> it sure cost a pretty penny, Rex. You did what I told you to do? Yes. I told the saleswoman who I was, and she let me pay for it on credit. <laughs> That's my girl. <laughs> Rex, how long can we continue living this way? <laughs> living what way, dear? They think we're Lord and Lady Somerset. But darling, we are Lord and Lady Somerset. <laughs> Lord and Lady Somerset, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The darlings of Woodstock Society, remember? For now. For years to come, Flo. Look at today's mail. <laughs> Three more invitations, including one from Thomas and Lily Harrington. <laughs> really? They're having a New Year's Eve party. Oh, the Harringtons invited <laughs> us? And the McGowans. Oh. Well, they're having a hunting expedition. <laughs> I tell you, darling, the town can't get enough of us. <laughs> We should have moved to Woodstock years ago. And you thought Canada was going to be boring. Who would have thought that a small town in Ontario would be so good to us? Your brilliant husband. <laughs> well, it sure beats milking the cows at five o'clock. Oh, Flo. Those days are over. Promise? I promise. You, Lady Somerset, are going to live in luxury for the rest of your life. The finest houses, the richest jewels, <laughs> and the prettiest dresses. <laughs> no more struggling, Flo. Lord Somerset, what would I do without you? <laughs> it won't happen, my love. They'd have to pry me away. Now, come. I've got tickets to the theater tonight. Oh! <laughs> oh, can I wear my new dress? Of course, Dolly. <laughs> Oh, how much further till we get to the farm, Rex? Just another mile, Freddy. We're almost there. I'm freezing. <laughs> You'll get used to Canadian winters, dear boy. Just give it some time. February is one of the coldest months. 
But I'm hungry. Hold on, Freddy. Once we get to the farm, we'll have bowls of piping hot soup. I told the kitchen staff to prepare for our arrival. Th this farm, Rex, it'll be just as you promised. Just as I promised, Freddy. With stables, servants, even electricity. But I don't see how a farm like that could be so close by, Rex. Well, it is, my boy. I assure you. And this property has all the amenities that a young English gentleman like yourself could desire. We'll still be business partners, uh, right? Of course, Freddy. Together, we'll make this the most lucrative farm in all of southern Ontario. Why, the profits from our horses alone will be enough to keep us living in luxury. Oh, luxury? Yes, luxury, dear boy. Look here. I promised your father that you continue living in the manner to which you're accustomed. And I intend to keep my promise, dear boy. I need to stop, Rex. I'm getting tired. Uh, just a little further, Freddy. We're almost there. No, no, Rex. I, I need to stop for a smoke. Canada isn't for sissies, Benwell. I told you you'd have to adapt to a harsher climate. But she didn't say anything about marching through a swamp. But it's the only way to reach the farm. But we've been walking four miles, and all I've seen are these tangles of stumps and branches everywhere. There's not a single sign of civilization. Uh, Freddy, I'm beginning to tire of your incessant complaining. And I'm beginning to tire of your lies. My lies. Yes, I'm beginning to think this business arrangement is just one big lie. Listen, boy, I'm a man of my word. <laughs> now, I promised you a farm, and I intend to deliver. So, I, if we just I, continue no, walking I, straight I, I've had enough, Rex. I'm going back to England, where I belong. But you can't mean that. I most certainly do. As soon as we get back, I'm writing my father and telling him not to send any more money your way. <laughs> Don't be so rash. Patience, dear boy. Patience is something I no longer have. But Rex. the farm is just yonder. I promise. No, forget it, Rex. We're through. But you can't do this. I most certainly but can. But you're mad, Freddy. Your future is here. There's nothing waiting for you back home. You know that. England is much better than this piece of swampland. But you're missing out on the opportunity of a lifetime. Well, you just take it. It's not for me. Your father. Your father will be very disappointed in you. Well, so be it. Oh, what about our deal? Oh, you'll have to find some other chap to do business with, Rex. Freddy. Please, reconsider. I already did. Damn you, Benwell! You'll regret this, Benwell! I swear! You'll rue the day you ever walked out on me. Buggery! Oh. God Almighty! Joseph! Come quick! Where is it, George? What's wrong? Look what I found! <gasps> a man! A dead man! A dead man here, Blood Swamp? Yep. Well, how the devil did he get here, George? Well, I haven't a clue. It looks like he's been here a few days, though. Well, he must have lost his way in the swamp. Poor soul. No one should die alone in a swamp. Well, indeed, George. Oh, George, I don't think he died alone. How do you know, brother? Oh, look at his head. Oh, two bottles. Dear God. Oh, what do we do, George? This, this matter is out of our hands now, Joseph. We must fetch Inspector Murray. Come quickly. Okay, George. Officer Murray. Can I help you? I'm Douglas Pelly. I know who killed Frederick Benwell. You do, do you? And who might that be? Reginald Birchall. How do you know, Mr. Birchall? 
He lured me to Canada, promising me partnership in a farm that he owned here. I suspect he made the same deal with Benwell. Did you know Benwell? Not very well. We came over on the same ship together, the Britannic. Have you ever seen this farm of Virgil's? No, but Benwell did, right before he was murdered. Do you know where this farm is? I suspect there never was a farm. It was all a plot to extort money from our families and then kill us. Mr. Belly, would you be willing to testify before the Crown? You would be our star witness. I'm not sure. Look at me. Virgil is a swindler, a fraud, and a cold-blooded killer. He deserves to hang for his crimes. Will you see to it that justice is served? Rest assured, Mr. Pelly. I will. All right. I'll do it. You'll never guess who I saw today. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Harrington at the dress shop. Uh -huh. She just been to the mill. It's late. Who can that be? Ah, Inspector Murray. So good to see you. Well, old boy, any news on the Benwell case? Yes. We've got our man. Oh, well done, Inspector. Well done. Well, my good man, tell us. Who did it? Don't you know? Well, uh, no, I don't, in fact. The jig is up, Virgil. What the devil do you mean? I mean, I'm placing you under arrest for the murder of Frederick Cornwallis you Benwell. You must be joking. Oh, no, I'm not. Inspector, you can't do this to my husband. There must be some kind of mistake. I'm completely innocent. I have evidence to the contrary. Evidence? What kind of evidence? You'll find out soon enough. Well, this is ludicrous. I'm telling you, you have the wrong man. Tell it to the jury, the, oh, Virgil. Well, why would I come forward and identify the body if I were the killer? To throw off suspicion, I suspect. It almost worked, too. Well, you haven't a bloody leg to stand on. You have no case. You're bluffing. Hmm. You better get yourself a good lawyer, Virgil. Because where you're going, it's not going to be pretty. Inspector, my husband is no killer. Uh, don't worry, Flo. The man is clearly incompetent. I'll get out of this jam and be back before you know it. I wouldn't bet on it, Birchill. You'll pay for this, Marie. When I'm through with you, you'll be the laughing stock of the Ontario Police Department. <laughs> All rise. The Oxford County Court of Assize is now in session. The Honorable Judge Hugh McMahon presiding in the Queen versus John Reginald Birchill. Mr. Virgil, how do you plead? Not guilty. Thank you, Mr. Virgil. Mr. Osler, you may state your opening remarks. Thank you, my lord. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the evidence will show that on February 17th, 1890, John Reginald Birchill murdered Frederick Benwell in Blenheim Swamp. Oh, he thought he had conceived the perfect crime, that no one would ever discover what he had done. But he was sorely mistaken. Crown witnesses will tell a tale of treachery, of greed, and corruption. Many Woodstock folk might recognize the defendant as Lord Somerset. <laughs> he charmed all of you led you to believe he was British aristocracy, when in fact he was a manipulative rogue who turned to murder in order to pay off his crushing debts. Well, Mr. Birchill, the charade is over. Prepare to meet your maker. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Osler. Mr. Blackstock, you may state your opening remarks. Thank you, my lord. Reginald Birchall did not kill Frederick Benwell. Indeed, there's not one piece of solid evidence to prove that my client committed murder. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I ask for your complete fairness in judging this man. 
His life depends on it. Thank you, Your Honour. Thank you, Mr. Blackstock. The Crown may call its first witness. Thank you, my lord. The Crown calls William H. Poole to the stand. State your name for the court. William Poole. Mr. Poole, what is your profession? Conductor of the Grand Trunk Railway. Where were you on the 17th of February? My train was traveling from Detroit to Niagara. It's a passenger train. Hmm. What time did you arrive at Eastwood Station? Uh, we arrived at 11.14 in the morning. Did you see the defendant disembark from your train? Uh, two men got off, one with a light complexion with light clothes on, and one with a dark complexion with dark clothes on. Hmm. What else did you notice about the dark one? Uh, he had a mustache. Ah, a mustache, like Mr. Burchill. Objection, Your Honor! Sustained. Once again, Mr. Poole, how many passengers got off at Eastwood? No, only two. Only two. Thank you. You are excused. Mr. Osler, you may call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The Crown calls Alice Smith. State your name for the court. Alice Smith. Where do you reside? I live in Eastwood with John Hayward, my grandfather. Can you recall what happened on the 17th of February? It was a Monday. I was at home in the morning. I went over in the afternoon to the station. And what time was this? About 3 o'clock. I went to send a letter by the 3 o'clock train. Our house is but a short distance from the station. What happened next, Miss Smith? I saw Mr. Dunn, the station master, and Jim Hayward, the postmaster, and the man they call Somerset. Huh. You mean Mr. Burchill? Yes. I'd seen him before in Woodstock, so his face was familiar to me. He came up and shook hands with me. He was going down Brantford Road, the road that leads up to the station. He said, how do you do? And I said, how do you do? And we walked to the station together. Then he went in and bought his ticket for Hamilton. What happened next, Miss Smith? Uh, I, I can't remember anything more that he said. Did you see him get on the train? No. No, I didn't see him get on the train. But I'm most sure he is the man who is known as Somerset in Woodstock. I have no doubt that this is the man. What did you notice about his appearance? He had no parcels, no overcoat on. I also noticed that he had laced boots on and that they were muddy. Ah. His pants were rolled up, he had a cap on, and he had a mustache, no side whiskers. I remember Lord Somerset, who was in Woodstock last year. I think he's the same person. Thank you, Miss Smith. You may be excused. Your Honor, the Crown would like to present this muddy boot as evidence. It was found at Birchall's residence on the night of his arrest. Ladies and gentlemen, if the boot is filthy, he must be guilty. Objection, Your Honor! Sustained. Mr. Osler, you may call your next witness. The Crown calls William Davis to the stand. State your name for the court. William Davis. What is your occupation? I am the town surveyor of Woodstock. Tell me, Mr. Davis, what is the distance round trip from Eastwood Station to Blenheim Swamp? About nine miles. Tell me. Would it be possible for a man to disembark from the train at 11.14 a.m., walk to the swamp, and then return to the station in time to board a 3.38 train back to Niagara Falls? Yes, Mr. Osler. And how do you know this for certain? Well, I've walked that distance myself. You have, and how long did it take you? Two hours and 48 minutes. Two hours and 48 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Davis. You are excused. Next witness. The Crown calls Douglas Pelly to the stand. State your name for the court. Douglas Pelly. Mr. Pelly, where did you first meet the defendant? In England. And what was the nature of your meeting? It was business. I was answering an ad he had placed in the newspaper. He said he had a farm in Canada. That it was 200 acres. He obtained from me 170 pounds sterling. The agreement 
was that he would pay my expenses and give me a share of his business profits. You made this arrangement sight unseen. I, I arranged to go to Canada to inspect the farm. If it met my approval, I would send for more money. Mr. Pelly, did you realize that Birchall had made a similar business arrangement with Mr. Benwell? No, I did not. He kept us apart on the ship. Mm. Told me that Benwell was not the sort of person I would care to be friends with. So, when did you first suspect that something was amiss? When he took Benwell to see the farm, and not the three of us. I found that rather odd. Ah. Then, when he returned without Benwell, I found that even more suspicious. It said that Benwell had gone to London, but I didn't believe him. What happened next, Mr. Kelly? A few days later, we were in Niagara Falls. He invited me to go for a walk on the suspension bridge. A couple of times, he pushed me towards the gorge. I'm telling you, had several people not been around, I would have met the same fate as Benwell. That man is a cold-blooded killer. Objection, Your Honor. Sustained. Thank you, Mr. Pelly. You may be excused. You will you burn in hell for what you did, Honor. Virgil! Pelly, return to your seat A little left. control, Your Honor. You'll be held in contempt. The Crown calls John Williams to the stand. State your name for the court. My name is John Williams. Mr. Williams, what is your occupation? I'm the property assessor in Stanford Township for the District of Niagara. Please tell the court, Mr. Williams, has John Reginald Birchall ever owned any property in the district? No, sir. There's no record of any purchase of that nature. None whatsoever. None whatsoever. Thank you, Mr. Williams. You are excused. Your Honor, the Crown would like to present this letter as evidence. Thank you, Mr. Rosler. It is written by John Reginald Birchall to Colonel Benwell, Frederick's father. It informs him of their safe arrival in Canada and requests that he forward 500 pounds to their joint bank account. Ladies and gentlemen, that letter is dated February 20th. What? three days after Frederick Benwell was murdered in Blenheim Swamp. Make no mistake, ladies and gentlemen, that letter proves, without a doubt, that this crime was motivated purely by money. Mr. Blankstock, you may call your first witness. Thank you, my lord. The defense calls Douglas Pelly. Again? Pelly? What more did he say? Thank you, Mr. Pelly. Have you ever seen a revolver in Mr. Birchall's possession? Yes. Yes, I did. And when was that, Mr. Pelly? It was on the ship Britannic. He showed it to me one night. He said that he kept it around in case there was ever any trouble. That he wanted to protect his wife. I see. Did it look like this? Yes. That's it. That's the gun. And what type of revolver is this, Mr. Pelly? I don't know. I, I'm not a gun expert. This is a 35 caliber, Mr. Pelly. All right. Then that's the one he used to kill Benwell. Why is that so important? Oh, but it's very important, Mr. Pelly. You see, the bullet holes found in Frederick Benwell's head were those of a 32 caliber, not a 35 caliber, thus proving the gun that killed Frederick Benwell did not belong to my client. I don't care what kind of gun was used. I still say he did it. That man is a liar, a swindler, and a cold-blooded killer. Thank you, Mr. Pelly. You are ex- You're just twisting facts to save his sorry soul. Thank you, Mr. Pelly. You are excused. Bailiff? Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Mr. Pelly is partially correct. My client is guilty of fraud. He may have taken Frederick Benwell's money, but never, ever did he take his life. Furthermore, all the evidence presented by the prosecution, purely and completely circumstantial, why neither Conductor Poole nor Miss Smith can positively identify the man who got on and off the train that fateful day as being Reginald Birchall. 
not one shred, not one iota of evidence to prove that my client is the one who committed this most heinous crime. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, acquit Reginald Birchall on this charge of murder. His life depends on it. Thank you, Your Honor. The defense rests. Before sentencing is passed, has the prisoner anything to say? Get up, my boy. Uh, simply that I am not guilty of the crime, my lord. Well said, sir. Thank you, Mr. Birchall. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, <clears throat> Please send for the bailiff when you have reached a unanimous verdict. The murder weapon, it wasn't a match. He had muddy boots. For heaven's sakes, everybody has muddy boots. He did have two hours and 48 minutes. He certainly did, Mr. It was very circumstantial, though. There wasn't any evidence that was very credible. Weapon. Have we agreed? So, yes, we've no. all agreed. Are we agreed? Fully agreed? All rise! Court is now in session. The Honorable Judge Hugh McMahon presiding. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have, Your Honor. What say you? We find the defendant guilty. John Reginald Birchall, the Oxford County Court of Assize, has found you guilty of murder. You will be remanded to the Woodstock Jail to await your execution. You have been sentenced to hang in six weeks on November the 14th, 1890. May God spare your soul. Court dismissed. Rex! Rex! Darling! I managed to get 5,000 signatures on our petition. I went all the way to Ottawa and I begged for a meeting with Prime Minister MacDonald. And? He would not listen. It's too late, Florence. My fate has been decided. Today shall be my last. No, Rex. I'll fight for you as long as I'm alive. The fight is over, Florence. So... What will I do without you? You'll go on. You go on, Florence. You'll be all right. The autobiography is sold well. You won't have to worry about money ever. Oh, Florence, go home. Go back to England to your parents. Perhaps, perhaps someday you'll find another man to love. Never, Rex. There could never be another man for me. You're so young, Florence. You have your whole life in front of you. I want you to be happy. Happy? Without you? Perfect. Flo, you, you know I'm innocent, right? Of course I do. I, I didn't kill that boy. No, no, you, I know you didn't, Rex. You don't have it in you to kill, and I know that from the depths of my soul. I love you. My I lady summer stuff. <laughs> Hands up, Virgil. Time to go. No, oh, please. Just one more moment, please. Goodbye, Flo, dear. No. Be brave. <laughs> Rex. Until <laughs> this there goes well, this innocent bastard now. Ha ha. <laughs> yeah. String him up. I don't know. What behavior? It's a truth. Public yeah. spectacle. So, Virgil, the day's here at long last. Quite the contraption you rigged up. You like it? I spent all day yesterday building this scaffold just for you. Impressive. 
This 350 pound weight comes all the way from Toronto's Don Gel. Don't you feel special? I am special. And innocent. Yeah. Yeah. The jury found you guilty. I'm here to carry out the will of the people. Hang yes, you, boy, you boy, you sir. There are many who believe I didn't lay a hand on that boy. That's right, Reginald. He's guilty. This is enough. They know the truth. They know the truth. You're right. Don't mean a damn thing to me. You're a cold-blooded murder virtually, and you're going to pay for what you did. I'm not afraid to die. Really? That's right. How brave of you, Virgil. Yeah. Do you ever wonder how it feels like to gasp for air? Unable to talk? Unable to breathe? The pain is excruciating. It's like nothing you ever experienced before, and I like taking my time. <laughs> you tried to scare me, Angman. <laughs> what a brave soul we have here, folks! Yeah. 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 I'll, I'll fight, you. Yeah. I'll fight yeah. all of you with every last breath that I have. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. You'll be begging me for mercy to finish you off. Go ahead and do it. Do it. I'm ready. No, Rex. Please. Oh, poor Flo. Such a shame, really, that uh, your last thought on Earth should be of me and uh, not of your beautiful wife. Have some decency, sir. You'll leave my Florence alone. Don't know why she ever saw in you, Virgil. This is uncool. You're a liar. No. A swindler. Cold-blooded killer. And you're a little weasel. Really, Rex? She could do much better than you. Oh. You leave her out of this, I said, or else... Or else what? I'll kill you, Hangman, I swear to God! I'll kill you! <laughs> How? From the other side? Don't mock me, Hangman. Vengeance might be had from the grave. Yes. Perhaps you'll see. Once again, you overestimate your power, Burchill. You're in my hands now. I'm in God's hands! Amen. Amen. God's Amen. Hands. And he shall judge me fairly! And so yes. he shall. And so will history. We will. we will remember you, Reginald. Any last words to speak? Say them now. Oh, Lord! Prepare to receive me in heaven, for I am an innocent man, unjustly accused of a crime I did not commit. Our no. Father, who oh, art in heaven, hallowed be thy no. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. No! <laughs>